video. Um, good morning, um, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, so it's it's. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have uh, uh, see people uh, joining uh, gradually. So, but let's get started since we are two minutes uh, past nine. Uh, it's it's you know it's great that we have this session called sensing perception, privacy, and security. You know, for for a transportation conference, I think it's. Uh, and necessary to combine all these technologies together, and I will I would call it uh, emerging technologies that will enable future uh, transportation mobility systems. So we have a uh, um, uh, six uh, presentations here in the session covering kind of a lot of different aspects. Uh, I personally will be uh, very actively participating in the discussions, and I hope you will uh, be so as well. Um, I think our first speaker is not here yet. Uh, I will start with uh, the second speaker. Um, uh, he will be giving us a presentation on the uh, te developing test mobile application to observe activities in public spaces. So it's a case study in Montreal, Canada. Speaker is uh, Frederick and Chabot, and he is actually a, a graduate student at uh, Polytechnic of uh, Montreal in Canada. And uh, uh, Frederick, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, I will share my screen. Okay. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, please go. All right. So let's start. <clears throat> yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm Frédéric Chabot, as he, <laughs> as he, as he said. And today I will present you a first step into what is now my master research project. Uh, the paper is called uh, Developing and Testing a Mobile Application to Observe Activities in Public Spaces. So it's a, a result of a case study I did in Montreal. This project it was under the supervision of uh, Geneviève Bojoli and my current director, Nicolas Saunier, both professors at Polytechnique Montréal. So, uh, yeah, so let's start with the plan of my presentation. I will introduce the project and go over some important aspects, and then I will show uh, some of the research I did to better understand the work I was about to do. And from there, I will go over the methodology and specify uh, important uh, features of this case study. And after that, I will show some results and interpretations of that first case study I did using the mobile application to end up with a, a short conclusion. So the introduction, uh, yeah, the first aspect that introduced this paper is the concept of private and public spaces, uh, more specifically how they affect our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, a second aspect uh, in my research is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this pandemic, as we know, uh, changed most of our lives. Uh, for example, how we go from one place to another and where we go. Uh, this eventually made uh, everyone understand the importance of public spaces. Therefore, uh, it's even more crucial to better uh, to learn more about about them, about those spaces, how they are used, uh, who use them, and much more. So, to better understand them, uh, we then need to measure and analyze their use. <clears throat> and as you might know, there are several ways to uh, to measure uh, public spaces, including different existing tools and methods, uh, which I will talk about uh, later. So it's basically from there uh, that the idea of creating and characterize, characterizing a, a new tool emerged. Uh, so you probably understood by now that I, I developed my own uh, mobile application and tested it in, uh, in, uh, in spaces. These are some of the mockups I created uh, while developing the application uh, two, days, uh, two years ago, sorry. <clears throat> Let's now go over the, uh, some of the literature review I did. First, the observation uh, method and biases. Uh, as you might know, there are many ways uh, to gather the data uh, to gather the data in public spaces, such as uh, manual collection. In other words, uh, doing it, doing it by hands with a pad, and uh, and your pencil, for example. Uh, we can also think about video data gathering and visual recognition using algorithms. But as you might also know, uh, both of uh, those uh, have their limits, uh, uh, such as the accessibility to the tool uh, and the efficiency to uh, take the data in. And that's one of the main reasons why my mobile application might be a good addition to those uh, to, to those tools. And secondly, a factor that can have a, an influence on the data collection itself is the level of uh, involvement of the, the observer. Uh, the people observing uh, in the space, uh, going from control, uh, naturalistic, to uh, full participant. 
Uh, in other words, uh, knowing that you are observed might have an influence on the way you will act in the public space. So the, the people who are observed might act differently. So that in, in a way, it's kind of uh, corrupting the data if you, if you, if you want. Uh, in our case, we did the naturalistic way. Uh, so we, uh, we just sit there on the side of the space and observe the people in the space and their activities uh, on our cell phones. So it was not too obvious. And finally, uh, the, it's obvious that there might be some biases coming from the observer. And to counter that, to analyze that, uh, there is two important steps we looked into uh, in this case study. Uh, first, the multi-source observation, and secondly, the inter-reliability -reli test. And uh, I will talk about that later, but to do so, uh, we did each uh, observation session with two observers. Uh, so the multi-source uh, is there. And uh, we, we tried to quantify the variability in between them, in between the, their, da uh, their data. Is, which was the inter reliability test we did. Yeah, so going back to the observation methods, I bet. I'm sorry? I think there's a, someone have a, a mic open, but uh, I'll keep going. Uh, I based uh, this case study on the KL Institute methods. Uh, they basically propose two ways to observe uh, public spaces. Therefore, the first one count the people passing uh, through an imaginary, in, imaginary line, such as the, the figure five you can see. And the other one is mapping activities observed in public space, just like on the figure six. Uh, those are, are uh, example I did myself, but uh, their application at uh, protocols, they, they propose some protocols on their website. Uh, but what I did is basically an in-between for this case study. Uh, I counted the people and observed what they were doing in the public space, but without specifically mapping them uh, in the space. Uh, it was just so, to make it uh, easier and uh, to observe the activities and uh, uh, you know, uh, the use of the space. <clears throat> yeah, so let's now go quickly over the interface design. Uh, I'm, I'm not a web designer, but uh, web design and app development are complex domains, and there's a lot to learn to, you know, to properly uh, uh, develop an application. In my case, I, like I said, I couldn't do so much, but I, I still looked up uh, on the web for some advice, such as the, the use of precise and clear icons, uh, the legible text, uh, users' uh, progression, privacy regarding users' information, and, and much more. But those are just details, but that, uh, that was uh, the, the first part of my research. I also looked up to see if there could be uh, some uh, similar application or concepts at least in other applications that I could use in my application. Doing so, I found a uh, Globe Observer and eBird. And just like my application, uh, Globe Observer and eBird are manual observed uh, observation based tool. Uh, so it's, uh, it's done by end with your cell phone. One for the fauna and the other was for the flora. So it's not uh, for people, but it's still uh, pretty similar. Uh, and both uh, got compared to scientific data and uh, got pretty good results uh, doing so. And also uh, what is interesting with eBird is the fact that uh, it's kind of an expert community. Uh, those people who, who like to observe uh, birds uh, and nature. And uh, the, the, the inter interesting aspect with Globe Observer is that, that there is, a, a, is the aspect of learnability using uh, images, tutorials, and uh, to, ups, to help uh, the observers uh, know how, learn how to observe properly. Because, uh, for example, they were observing clouds uh, with the application. So how you can you tell if the, it's a, a lot of clouds uh, or not? It's, so it could be difficult for a new, uh, a new observer. And uh, uh, yeah, since the, the beginning of my project, I also found uh, two very two other very similar application based on the same observation methods. Uh, I based this case study on, which are the the Gale Institute methods. Uh, first, I found Common Space much earlier, but uh, sadly at this point it was not available in Canada, so I couldn't really use it or at least even compare uh, with it compared it with my application. Uh, I did find uh, some case study that might have used the application, but I'm, what I'm sure is that they, they use the Gale Institute methods in those case study, but I didn't, I didn't find anything more uh, about that uh, with common space. 
Uh, about CounterPoint, I found it a little too late uh, as I was getting ready uh, to gather the data for this case study. I just found it ju just before, so I couldn't really use it. Uh, although CounterPoint is a, a Canadian application, uh, uh, and it was used in a recent project uh, on bicycle use and gender in all the country. So I know it's uh, it's a good application, but like I said, I found it too late uh, to use it for my case study. <clears throat> yeah, so let's now go more into depth about the, the methodology itself. First, I uh, I developed the application on Tunkable. Uh, you might know what it is. It's a web tool to develop small and simple application. Uh, the development was iterative all along uh, as I was testing it myself in some parks <laughs> around my apartment. Uh, so I was just developing, designing, and testing it, uh, just looking out by my window even if I wanted to. And then <clears throat> before going, going through this CDKs, I did one last uh, beta test uh, with the research group where I'm working right now and with some collab collaborators I have uh, I had at, it, at the time to see if uh, there was any uh, difficulty understanding the application or how to use it or major uh, error with the application itself. With those feedback, I, I then proceeded to the last uh, update and prepare my application for the case study. So yeah, these are the, the five basic screens I designed and used to gather the data. So there was a, a main interface, a profile interface, a commentary interface, and the two needed to do the observations. Uh, one for the session characteristics, which is the, the second to the left, and the other uh, where the observers enter, uh, enter the data, uh, which is the, the middle one. Uh, yeah. And this, uh, right, uh, yeah. this is this, the database structure I developed, a uh, pretty simple one. It was just important uh, for me to make sure that I could separate the, the data collected by each observer and by each day of observation. And that I would be also able uh, to see some of the uh, observer's behavior. Uh, yeah, so that's why uh, there is uh, all those unique ID and all those uh, different uh, screen or table. <clears throat> and as for the case study description, there is a total of uh, five observer, and for each of the session of, uh, observation session, there is a uh, there is a pair of observer, so always two observer at a at a time. And only a brief explanation was given to make sure uh, the observers took you know uh, intuitive decisions as they discover the application, just like they would discover any other application. And the uh, the case study is done uh, was done at the Shamrock Place, uh, a small public space of uh, uh, 900 square, square meters, or at least uh, a little less than 10,000 square feet. Uh, and the, in this space, uh, we could found uh, some tables, a uh, teleworking station, and uh, a free, free Wi-Fi was uh, available uh, at this point. And for the temporal aspect, uh, I, uh, we did three sessions. Uh, and every uh, yeah three sessions uh, every week and we did that three weeks in a row and every session started around 12:30 uh, p.m. Uh, yeah 12:30 p.m. and ended up around 1:30 p.m. so this was just to include uh, you know a part of the lunch break and a part of the uh, the beginning of the afternoon and regarding the deliberation uh, for every week uh, we did a different uh, area of the public space. Uh, we observed the different area of the public space to see if uh, any big differences uh, would appear. So as we see, uh, the first week was on the left, the second week was the, the right part, and uh, we then ended up with all the space the third week. Uh, yeah, then uh, there is the attributes of the people we uh, observed in this pu public space. Uh, we did decided to observe only three attributes to make it easier for the observers. Uh, so we, we we looked at the activities, the group size, and the postures. Uh, and the values you, you see in the table there are mostly based on the same Gale Institute methods I talked about uh, earlier. Finally, uh, most of the results uh, are converted into proportions uh, in my database. In other words, the number of time we observed a specific value, a specific activities uh, in all observations made so. Uh, yeah, with those proportions, uh, we then calculated a difference indicator, which is basically uh, like a, a Rodeo Manhattan distance. So, for example, let's take the activities. 
uh, for a pair of, of observer i and j on a day and k possible uh, values for that attribute, we simply sum all uh, the difference of each proportion. So I'll give you an example. So let's say the, there is an observer A uh, who observes 50% uh, of uh, an activity one in that space. And there is the observer B who observed only 10% of that activity in the space. Then this difference will be 40% uh, uh, or 0 0.4. We did, the, we did this calculation for each possible value of that attribute. Then we summed all up together, uh, all the values together. And the same was done for each attribute uh, we had in the, uh, we had for the, that uh, data collection. And ju just so you know, this indicator is one way we found to uh, quantify the variability in between its observer. Uh, and so the bias possible biases uh, there was in place uh, in the observers uh, themselves. <clears throat> so let's now go to the results uh, of this case study. Uh, as some notes were taking during the sessions, uh, I summarized here some interesting points I found. Uh, first, the, as the application is developed on a web tool, uh, a simple web tool, it, it was sometimes slow on some devices, so it uh, it could uh, affect the observation. Also, as one uh, as one trick was to literally memorize uh, the attributes of many groups at the same time, and enter them afterward. This became very difficult, as you might uh, understood, uh, understand. Sorry, <clears throat> uh, when the space was too crowded. And uh, thirdly, uh, yeah, the area corresponding to the second week uh, seemed a, a bit more occupied, but I, we couldn't really find any reason for that. It's just uh, maybe the, the the more table in, in the, the space at this point or uh, uh, in this area. Sorry, but it's it wasn't really. Uh, there, there was no other uh, no way to, to explain that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and uh, and finally, this question seems to uh, allow for more uh, reasonable interpretation or observation from the observers. <clears throat> As I was there observing myself, I, I could really see that uh, just talking to the other observers could help or make it more uh, reasonable, you know, to 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 enter uh, to input some of the the observations some of the attributes we were observing. And yeah, this table is just to let you see some uh, technical aspects. Uh, first, the, the observer number one, as you can see, was there for each session uh, to act as some kind of reference, if you know, uh, if you want. <clears throat> also, it's important to note that uh, the sessions where there was a technical issue, so uh, maybe a bug or a Wi-Fi bug or anything, uh, they were not considered in the next results uh, I will present. So. Uh, all the session, even the if just uh, if only one of the two observers uh, had a bug, both were uh, not considered in the data. So just to keep uh, to keep the data where we could compare uh, two observers for that day. And this first figure is just uh, an example that we can have some interesting results when we look at the time each data was uh, registered in the application. Uh, this is something uh, manual data gathering could not easily do, you know, enter the time. Each time you enter a value, you, you need to enter the time. It, it could become uh, very difficult for the observer, but with the application, it was just uh, automatic. Uh, yeah, and here in general, uh, as you can probably see, we were able to deduct that most of the people uh, observed uh, in the space were there after 1 p.m., so, so after the lunch break. Uh, yeah, also note that uh, we, we did this with uh, just the, you know, the limit of one, uh, one and after 1 p.m. before 1 p.m. But we we could have done this on the on the continue uh, with continu continuity or you know some interval of 15 minutes or five minutes interval to see if there is uh, any variability in time. Uh, yeah, and looking at the proportions I talked about earlier in the activities attribute here, we can see a general consistency. Uh, like it's difficult to really. Uh, uh, see some differences, uh, except for the observer number four, uh, and uh, so, uh, sorry, except for when the observer number four uh, observed, and the very next session uh, with the observer number five. So on the in the graph, it's the fourth and the fifth segment uh, that you can see. <clears throat> uh, both times uh, the value others 
so it's, it's a bunch of activities uh, to all regrouped together. Uh, it, it was more selected. Uh, it was selected more often by the observer number one. Um, and after looking at the data itself, uh, I discovered that the observer number four considered the, 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 acti the activities as an exclusive variable. So each time uh, that observer only input one single value. Uh, so this is why may maybe there was uh, so much difference uh, for that day. And sadly, I couldn't find anything uh, for the fifth session. So it's maybe just a misunderstanding uh, from one, one or the other observers. But I, I, I can't find anything else uh, than that. Um, continuing with the attributes again, uh, we can now see the difference indicator I talked about uh, earlier, but there for each of the attributes. And as you can see, uh, even for a same pair of observers, so let's say the, the, the second and the third session uh, with the, the pair of observer one and three, the results are not the same. So there's always a little bit of uh, variability uh, even in the difference in, in between the, the same pairs of observer, of observer, sorry. And uh, yeah, and generally uh, speaking, the attribute uh, activities seems to be the one with the higher values. Uh, maybe it's because there, there is just more uh, possibilities of activities uh, than there is a possible, of, uh, possible values of uh, group size and so on. If you, Frederick, if you can wrap up in one minute, that'd be great, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I, have a, <laughs> I don't have any batteries in my headset. I'm sorry. Yeah, so. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, you if can, you can wrap up in one minute, that'd be great. Yeah, it's... I'll go back there. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And like, like I said, the activities uh, seems the attribute with the, 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 higher, the higher values, uh, maybe because, uh, like I said, uh, there is a, maybe there is more possible uh, activities than there is a possible uh, group sizes. Um, and this last table is just to, to show you some of the results we obtained regarding the observer's behavior. So we can see that even though the observer number one selected more values in general, with uh, the 3.99 3 clicks uh, or input uh, per observations, the time taken for each of those observations is on the low side uh, comparing, uh, compared to the, the other groups with just uh, 41 seconds. Moreover, uh, we can see that uh, less misclicks were made by this, uh, this observer. Uh, and this could be explained uh, by the fact that uh, the, the observer number one uh, observed each time. So maybe he, he might have gained some experience uh, 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 during, the, during, during the sessions, sorry. And just so you know, the I consider the misclicks uh, when a, an observer just uh, input a value and then undo it before uh, submitting uh, the observation in the application. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, the application, uh, uh, let, me, let me see that there is a, indeed some differences in between observers data. But it's still uh, important to know that the number of data collected is was relatively small in that case, and only uh, three attributes were, were considered, and only five observers were considered uh, to to do this case study, and this case study was just in one public space. So, even though we can see uh, the possibility with uh, that kind of data gathering tool to analyze and understand uh, more about public spaces, it's still clear that more data would be needed to, to have some, uh, some conclusion. We need more people, we need more, uh, we need more observers, we need more attributes, and we need more context, more public spaces. We need more study cases. So yeah, that, would, that will be all. Thank you all for listening. And I will now be answering any questions you, you might have. Or you can also type your questions in the chat or uh, even contact me on my, uh, by mail. Great, thank you, Frederick. Um, since we're out of time a little bit, maybe we have uh, time for one quick questions uh, for one quick question for Frederick. Any from audience? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, or you can also follow up with um, uh, questions in the chat box. I may have asked one quick question, then we can move on to the next. So, what is the um, uh, use cases, potential use cases that you know 
for, for your uh, results. Right? So you collect all these activities data. What are the future use cases that you are looking at? Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, just uh, that would be probably uh, the same uh, I will, I'll do same uh, the same methodology and the same using the the same uh, inter interface that I, I showed you before but uh as i, I actually uh, at the beginning of the summer i did uh, another case study uh, very similar uh, observing a, a small space approximately uh, the same size but it was a uh, it was a, a different i was comparing not with another observer with the application but i was comparing it to another observers with another methods uh with some collaborators we had but their tools were this was basically a pad and a pencil like i said and so it was like a a matrix based uh on a paper uh, matrix based a uh, table that they just they would input with just uh, you know uh their pencils on the on the, the sheet of paper so i was comparing uh how quick or how good i could observe the, the space comparing to that kind of uh, of method of of tool if you want but the the, the the basic idea is that i i want to compare with the more more and more uh, other tools uh, video data, data gathering or uh, other manual uh, uh, other tool other, other manual tool like i said and just to go in more public spaces uh, in more context like i said just more at, or try maybe other attributes other variables to observe because uh, I, as you can see, some attributes are uh, more difficult to observe, or it's not. Uh, we we don't uh, understand how to. How can I say that? Like, for example, if you want, if you see someone with a cell phone, you you can't really tell if he's he's reading, is he on the, uh, is he chatting, is he playing a game? So the interpretation of uh, an observation could be very different, and that's uh, that's also one aspect I want to. I want to quantify, if you want, uh, with more observers uh, observing the same uh, the same space. So yeah, okay. I, we have a lot of uh, different uh, roads, if you want, <clears throat> that we want okay. to to look at. Great, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Interest. Uh, it's interesting work. If you ever have questions, please send a chat to uh, Frederick. Uh, you can continue the uh, exchange ideas. So let's move on to our next speaker. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll not share my screen in this case. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Xing Xia uh, from uh, UCLA. He's going to talk about uh, security or code localization. Uh, it's a uh, work, joint work with uh, myself as well and our team members. Um, and Xing, I would appreciate it if you can keep your presentation below uh, 15 minutes so we can have some opportunities for questions and answers and keep the session uh, within time limit. Yeah, sure. I will try to yeah. make sure. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Hi, uh, everyone. This is Xin Xia. I'm, I'm an assistant product scientist um, in UCLA Mobility Lab, directed by Dr. Jia Chima. And today I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, report our uh, recent work about the secure cooperative localization for connected automated vehicles based on the consensus estimation. And this is the agenda of, our, of my presentation. First, I will talk about the background and then uh, I, I will discuss the uh, um, uh, methodology section and then I will show you some results. And finally, uh, I will conclude this work. And first, uh, as we all know that cooperative driving automation um, as standardized by SAE J3216 aims, aims at to combine the um, uh, individual um, um, connected, uh, individual vehicle, automated vehicle and the connected automated vehicles and you, you uh, make them uh, cooperative, uh, co cooperative, cooperative together and to improve the uh, efficiency of the transportation and also the safety of the vehicle. Uh, and um, also, uh, the terminals in the intelligent transportation system can share the, their onboard sensors information through the V2X communication. And by using uh, those sensors, we can perform the uh, cooperative perception, which is a, a very um, uh, important component in the cooperative driving automation technologies. 
And those sensors can be used to perform the cooperative detection and cooperative local localization estimation and prediction. And uh, as you can see uh, uh, in this figure, this is proposed by our UCLA Mobility Lab. And today uh, we are going to talk about the cooperative localization part. And uh, for localization um, in the individual automated vehicles, uh, we can use the sensors like LiDAR, camera, IMU, GPS, and radar, and other onboard sensors to localize the vehicle. And, and I think the uh, multi-sensor fusion-based localization for, for, for the uh, individual automated vehicles has great potentials uh, in terms of the uh, good accuracy and, and robustness. However, um, even though uh, in, there are some other cases uh, those sensors cannot handle, so uh, we we uh, it's better to have uh, to have the uh, uh, the shared information from other vehicles to improve the uh, um, the uh, robustness and accuracy and the resili resilience to the attack um, performance on the each vehicle. And so uh, I will give you some uh, very brief literature review uh, for the uh, cooperative local localization uh, methodologies. And in the literature, um, uh, most uh, work uh, is based on the uh, centralized uh, localization approach uh, by uh, to fuse the information from the GPS and also the shared information from each vehicle. And for the centralized estimation algorithm, um, it is uh, very vulnerable to the uh, potential attacks and, and it will also require uh, huge computational resor resources. So uh, compared to uh, compare with the centralized algorithm, the uh, distributed fusion algorithm is more promising uh, in, in terms of the uh, accuracy and also the attack resilience. So given that, uh, um, I will talk about the, uh, um, the methodology part of this work. Um, this slide shows the, uh, uh, the, the uh, problem formulation. As, as we can see here, um, uh, this is meant for, uh, mainly for the uh, platooning uh, scenario. As we can see for each vehicle here, um, it is equipped with, the, uh, with an IMU sensor, the GPS sensor, and, and a LiDAR or radar sensor. And also uh, um, they have the V2X communication um, capability and so uh, based on those sensors for each vehicle we can uh, estimate the position through uh, the uh, IMU integration and also obtain the position from the GPS or other vehicles by uh, the LiDAR or radar sensors. However, um, if we want to uh, use the uh, sensor from other vehicles, we need to use the V2X communication and through this communication channel, uh, those those, uh, send, uh, those shared information could be uh, uh, attackable, meaning that um, uh, there there might be faults in the uh, measurement from the GPS or LiDAR or graded radar. And with uh, this assumption, um, we propose our uh, uh, consensus-based uh, localization approach for those. Um, uh, connected automated vehicles. And this work aims at to design the uh, uh, secure cooperative localization for, from two aspects. And the first one is uh, we try to uh, leverage the information from, uh, from the each uh, vehicle through a uh, distributed consensus scheme. And another part is uh, we try to propose a, a fault detection and isolation approach to a uh, uh, to make this methodology uh, resilient. Um, <laughs> this slide shows the, uh, um, uh, the implementation, in implementation of the uh, consensus algorithm. Uh, specifically, we, we are using, oh, sure. right, using the uh, consensus common information filter here. And, ah. okay. uh, and the, um, uh, the basic motivation here is the uh, we can fuse the sensory information from different sources, and also we can uh, perform perform the consensus estimation in a distributed uh, estimation framework. And as we can see here, uh, the, the each node in a consensus common filter can be driven by the uh, position from 
from, from the ego vehicles GPS or the uh, position from other uh, vehicles through the V2S communication. And those nodes are um, extendable, um, meaning that we can, uh, when we have more connected lot of vehicles, we can, we can add more nodes in this uh, distributed consensus, consensus estimation framework. And, and also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, those sensors uh, from those information from other vehicles um, um, is attackable. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, uh, figure out a method to uh, detect those faults. And I think um, I, I will try to convey the basic idea uh, of this method because it is a little complex to, uh, to, 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 to understand. Uh, so the basic idea is, um, um, as we all know that uh, if we want to uh, detect the fault very accurately, uh, we need to use uh, the multi samples from the sensor measurement instead of just use one uh, uh, measurement. Um, so uh, if we use uh, a multiple samples, then the issues uh, is that the uh, detection uh, of the fault uh, will have some time delay. Uh, so uh, to uh, address this issue, um, we actively uh, delay the measurement uh, um, of the, from the IMU and also the GPS to estimate the uh, state in the past. Uh, in the past, and then uh, based on the past state, we we uh, we will have the fresh relative to the the past uh, state. We have the fresh measurement in the current time, and then we combine the uh, uh, delayed. A state and the current fresh element, we can detect the fault, uh, which is uh, which happened happened in the in the past, and then um, so uh, because we have the fresh measurement in, in the current time, and then uh, uh, for the past uh, fault, there is no time delay, and then uh, to fill the gap between the past uh, state and the current state, we we can uh, leverage the information from the IMU to make the prediction uh, because the prediction period of time is very short so there won't be a uh, some large uh, accumulation uh, accum accumulated uh, position error and regarding the uh, after uh, de detect the uh, fault we need to uh, to uh, uh, to make the uh, estimation resilient uh, to uh, uh, for for this we uh, we can uh, we propose to um, isolate the fault once the fault is detected by uh, enlarge the uh, covariance matrix uh, in the uh, in the uh, consensus common filter, and in the meantime, uh, the measurement from from other vehicles uh, can be uh, with, without fault can be uh, continuously leveraged for the uh, measurement update in the common filter, as long as not all the uh, measurements are attack attacked. And the uh, uh, consen consensus uh, estimation framework can provide the uh, uh, continuous um, position estimation with uh, good accuracy. So uh, then I will show you some uh, simulation results uh, to validate the approach. Uh, uh, this is the scenario uh, we considered in the scenario uh, in a simulation, and we we add. No, noise to the IMU sensor, uh, GPS sensor, and also the relative distance sensor uh, sens uh, information from, from the radar or the LiDAR. Uh, and also uh, we, we added the uh, attacks in the uh, uh, GPS measurement, and also the uh, our algorithm is tested in the directed and undirected communication topology. Um, as we can see here, uh, this is the uh, results for the attack detection. And, and as we can see from this figure, uh, the uh, black lines shows the, uh, uh, the actual position of each vehicle, vehicle one to vehicle four. And we can see uh, we add some offset uh, position errors to, to the uh, colored lines, like the green line or the yellow line here. And uh, the details of the attack uh, can be seen from this table. And in the right figure, we can see the, uh, uh, the attack detection results. 
and we can see um, for uh, when there is a attack for each vehicle and we will uh, set the uh, uh, indicator as one uh, to show how the, uh, uh, the, the attack is detected. And we can see that um, uh, the black line shows the uh, reference uh, attack signal and, and the red line shows the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the detection time. And we can see um, through the uh, uh, delay and prediction framework, we can detect the attack in advance uh, uh, when the um, attack happened. And then uh, in this slide, um, we can see some uh, accuracy uh, analysis re results. And uh, in this table, we can see that uh, the, uh, the, common, the KF means the centralized common filter and the uh, CKF means the uh, consensus common information filter. We can see that uh, with, uh, with um, using information from more, uh, from more vehicles, the um, absolute mean error and also the root, root uh, mean square error uh, decrease. Um, for example, for the vehicle two, uh, the, uh, the mean error decreased from uh, 0 0.4 to uh, about 0 0.2, their, their, the, the accuracy um, is increased significantly. And when more vehicles are connected, both the accuracy and the security of the localization can be uh, improved. So to conclude um, this work, uh, in this work, we, uh, uh, we proposed a um, secure cooperative localization method for the connected automated vehicles. And the results uh, uh, showed that indirected, undirected, and fully connected auto, uh, communication topology, the uh, uh, sensor information uh, from uh, both the Agile vehicle and other uh, adjacent vehicles uh, can be leveraged uh, by this uh, consensus estimation scheme. And, and, and when uh, more um, uh, information, uh, when information from more vehicles um, uh, is received by the Agile vehicle, the uh, position accuracy can be uh, Enhanced and and also the uh, time delay issue for the uh, for the tradition uh, for detection method can be uh, uh, resolved by our uh, delay and prediction framework. Um, yeah, I think this is for uh, for the presentation. And any questions? Uh, welcomed. Yeah, thank you, Xing. Yeah. Um, any any questions from the audience for for Xing? Um, I, I have a question. So, so do you think like uh, the number of CV, CV will make uh, any difference to the results? Like uh, more CVs will probably could uh, increase, uh, improve the accuracy and uh, less, less CV probably can decrease the uh, accuracy like that. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, there are, uh... To answer your questions, there are two aspects. Uh, first, um, we uh, when uh, the uh, number of uh, CAV increase, we can see from this table both the uh, mean error and the uh, root square um, mean error can uh, decrease significantly. And another aspect is that uh, as long as not all the uh, CAV um, attacked, uh, there there will be a correct. Uh, or uh, accurate uh, signal from the GPS or the uh, inter uh, interdistance uh, from the radar or uh, LiDAR sensors, and we can keep the ac accuracy uh, uh, very high as long as not all the CAVs are attacked. So um, in this manner, we can see uh, the both the accuracy and the resilience uh, against the attack can be uh, uh, improved by this consensus estimation framework. Okay, thank you uh, for your answer. Uh, may I have one question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. So I'm um, just wondering um, how you define your, your motion model or state transition model for your common filter? Because I believe that, um, so when you incorporate more uh, vehicles information into the consistent common filter, does that mean that you are changing your model uh, accordingly as well? Um, not exactly. Uh, for, for for the model we use, um, because 
uh, in this work, we, uh, we, we, we only consider the uh, motion in a longitudinal direction, meaning that mm -hmm. uh, the model is based on the, uh, it, it's a kind of kinematic model based on the uh, IMU in, uh, integration. And uh, regarding your question, uh, yes, I, if we consider um, uh, uh, both, uh, also the uh, lateral direction uh, motion, we, we, we need to uh, extend uh, the uh, kinematic model to uh, consider both the uh, movement, uh, mo movement in both direction. And I think um, uh, as long as uh, the model uh, can uh, cover, I think uh, as long as the model uh, is defined, uh, the, the model will can uh, cover both the di direct, uh, longitudinal direction or the lateral direction. And uh, so uh, there won't be the uh, model transition uh, uh, during the uh, estimation. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I assume there's no other questions. If you have questions, feel free to uh, email Xing or text him uh, in the chat box. So let's move to our next presentation. Um, so our next presenter is also from uh, Hao, uh, Hao Xiang. He is uh, with UCLA, also uh, my group uh, with the UCLA Mobility Lab. He's gonna present a uh, cooperative perception detection, uh, a, a, a data sets we did for o, uh, called OPV2V, which is under the co overall cooperative perception framework uh, uh, Xing just presented. Xing focuses on localization, that paper for localization, uh, how we'll be focusing on the detection. Okay, uh, how please go ahead and what is yours? Sure, uh, can I share the screen? Yeah, please. Yes, I, uh, I make you a co-host. Got it, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Hao Xiang. I'm like Professor Jia Xinma mentioned. Uh, I'm from uh, USA Mobility Lab and I'm, I'm a PhD student. Uh, and today I'm very happy to share our work OPV2V and Open Benchmark Dataset and Fusion Pipeline for Perception with Vehicle to Vehicle Communication. Here's today's agenda. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so single agent perception algorithm usually suffer from sparse measurements caused by occlusion and the far distance, like shown in the finger here. The ego agent here plans to turn left in a T intersection, but the uh, roadside parking vehicle is blocking ego vehicle side out view to the incoming traffic circled by the red circle, like shown here. As a result, the ego agent have no measurement for those two vehicles, so there's no way for the ego agent to detect them, which is very dangerous and can cause severe accidents. However, by leveraging the vehicle to vehicle communication technology, the CMB1 can share its sensing information with the ego agent. And as a result, the ego agent can now see those two vehicles by leveraging the holistic view of the whole environment, which can, uh, which can help the ego agent to detect them uh, and help them to, to boost the perception capability and performance. However, there are several challenges for the V2V perception. Firstly, it is very expensive to collect the real world data, especially with multiple CIVs. And secondly, there's no existing large scale open data set for V2V perception to facilitate the algorithm benchmark. To this end, we propose the first large scale open data set for perception with V2V communication collected by Kala and OpenCDA. In our data set, we have over uh, 70 interesting scenarios, and each one has several autonomous vehicles and realistic traffic flow. And we have the LiDAR and the RGB data for each of the CIV. And uh, in our data set, we have over uh, six road types and nine cities, including eight color default towns and one digital town of color city, which we built with mirror traffic flow as a realistic uh, traffic flow. And also we have over 11,000 uh, LiDAR frames and 45,000 RGB images and 230,000 annotated 3D bounding boxes. Here we present the data, a example of our data set. Uh, the top left finger shows the aggregated LiDAR point clouds from three CIVs. And the bottom finger shows them, uh, the camera data from those CIVs. And here we present the diverse road types in our data set. It has six road types in suburb, urban, rural, and freeway areas. 
next we present the uh, image of our cover city, digital town of our cover city, uh, like shown in these uh, fingers, uh, the, the traffic flow mirror the uh, realistic traffic flow. Here we present the statistic of our data set. The left finger shows that by leveraging the V2V communication technology, uh, the, the sensing information is greatly improved and the number of points uh, per proxies is also higher than the single agent uh, system. And the right finger shows that our data set has diverse vehicle types and with different bounding boxes sizes. And the bottom table shows the diverse statistic of data set, including different road types, diverse CIV numbers, uh, traffic density, speed, and also CIV speed, et cetera. Uh, besides the data set contribution, we also present an open coding framework for the cooperative perception. Uh, it includes three fusion strategies, early fusion, late fusion, and the intermediate fusion. For the early fusion, basically we broadcast a row LiDAR point clouds uh, within the collaboration graph or within the communication range. And the ego agent will receive those LiDAR point clouds to do the final prediction. For the late fusion, each CFV will predict the bounding box separately, and the prediction outputs will be circulated within the collaboration graph. And the ego agent will receive those bounding boxes uh, proposals and then future proposals to generate the final prediction. And for the intermediate fusion, we will broadcast the intermediate features, and the ego agent will receive the feature and apply the neural network to aggregate the feature and to do the final 3D prediction. The more detailed diagram is shown here. Like I mentioned before, for the early fusion, the line upon clouds is broadcasted with all of the neighboring agents, and the ego agent will apply, uh, will, will aggregate the line upon clouds to the holistic view, and then apply the classical 3D detection network to do the 3D detection task. For the intermediate feature, intermediate fusion pipeline, the uh, each agent will first will first extract the intermediate feature based on its own. Uh, sensing observation, and then this intermediate feature will be shared, and mm -hmm. then the ego agent will receive all of the intermediate features and then apply some uh, network like graph neural network or the max pooling to aggregate the feature and then uh, apply to the detection head to generate the final prediction outputs. For the late fusion, uh, each agent will uh, reason the output separately, and this output will be uh, circulated with all of the neighboring agent. And the ego agent will receive the prediction proposal from all the neighboring agent and apply algorithms like non-maximum suppression to fuse the proposal to generate the final prediction outputs. Here is the um, intermediate fusion pipeline proposed in our paper. Uh, in this paper, we propose a new attentive fusion uh, algorithm to fuse the feature. The whole pipeline can, um, uh, consists of several components, including metadata sharing, feature extraction, compression, feature sharing, attentive fusion, and prediction header. Uh, during the early stage of collaboration, each CIV will share the metadata like the poses, time step, et cetera, with each other. And the ego agent will, will receive all of those information as well. And after that, each CIV will project their LIDAR observation to the ego agent coordinate frame. And after that, this LIDAR point class will be passed to the feature structure to generate the intermediate feature. And then we'll apply a, a, one, a series of one-time-one -one convolutions to compress the feature along the channel dimension. And this compressed channel, uh, compressed feature will be shared with all of the neighboring agent. And the ego agent will receive this compressed feature and apply another series of one-time-one -one convolution to decompress the feature to the original size. And after, the, after that, all of this feature will be passed to the fusion model to fuse the feature from different agent. And uh, we propose the attentive fusion uh, to, to fuse all of those features. The self-attention will be operated per special location to fuse a feature from different positions like shown in the, this diagram. The insight is that for the observation that is close to the, C, uh, to the ego, but is very far away from the CIV-1, then we may want to trust the observation from ego more. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, if the observation is very far away from ego, like here, but it's very close to the CIV-1. In this case, this special location, we, we want to trust the CIV-1's observation more. So we do the self-attention per special location instead of a scalar attention weight for the feature map. And our experiment demonstrates that by using this strategy, we can um, extract more informative feature representation. And this feature will be passed to a detection head to generate the final prediction output. Here is a benchmark result of our data set with different fusion strategies, uh, like shown in the table. 
our intermediate fusion um, pipeline outperform all the other fusion strategies. Uh, here's a quantitative visualization of the pillar backbone uh, of different fusion strategies. Um, like together with the OP, uh, OP V2V dataset, we open source the first corruptive detection framework, OpenCRUD. We provide easy APIs for converting the OP V2V dataset data to the right format for PyTorch model. And in our bench, uh, in our OP, uh, OpenCRUD uh, uh, repository, we, we provide several state of the art 3D uh, LiDAR detection backbones, including point pillar, second, voxel net, and pixel. And also we provide some common multi-agent perception fusion strategies like the uh, early, late, and the intermediate fusion. Uh, besides that, we also provide a state of the art corruptive detection models, including F Cooper, Cooper Attentive Fusion, V2V Net, and also the Reason Disco Net and the V2X VIT. The models will be kept updated. And if you're interested, uh, you can click our code link and project and also the project uh, page to see more details about our work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hal, for the great presentation. So, any um, any questions that from audience? Um, I have a question. So, um, is there any reason you choose like uh, self attention to use uh, informations and uh? Uh, yes, uh, we use the self-attention to use the uh, features instead of like max pooling because we, uh, like uh, we mentioned before, we think that uh, each special location may contain some informative features like different noise level, etc. If we use just the plan uh, neural network to do that, it may not be able to capture the relative weights. But if we use a graph neural network like the self-attention, then we can capture the relative importance between different feature maps in different locations. And in this way, we can um, provide a more informative feature representation to fuse them. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, and uh, did we also like uh, use some other models like this or RN to fuse the uh, information? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, in our code framework, uh, in this paper, our proposed strategy is the attentive fusion, which is self-attention basically. But like I mentioned in the last slides, um, we also benchmark several other um, state-of-the-art quality perception framework, like the F Cooper, Cooper, et cetera. And for those networks, like the V2B net, it utilizes a, 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 a LSTM and also the convolutional graph neural network, et cetera, to, to extract the feature. And for the F Cooper and Cooper, it leveraged the um, some, some max pooling or some other uh, neural network to, to do that. So um, we we also provide several other models to uh, to compare it, and it also listed in our open code benchmark table. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. You're yeah, welcome. Do you have any other questions for Hal? Okay, yeah, if you may uh, feel free to reach out to him. Uh, I think we are gonna move on to the next speaker. Um, so next speaker is uh, Ying Yong Wan, uh, uh, the University of Michigan. He will be presenting uh, real-time sensor anomaly detection and recovery in connected automated vehicle uh, for uh, sensor, sensor in the systems. Um, so Ying Yong, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jetsima. And uh, let me share my screen. Um, could you please uh, grant me the uh, grant me the access to share the screen? Uh, yes, I have made you uh, the call. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen right now? Yes, we can see it. Go okay. Ahead. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure today um, to give uh, you a presentation uh, about my um, previous research. And my name is Ian Wang, and I'm a PhD student uh, from University of Michigan, uh, civil and environmental engineering, uh, working with Professor Nada Masood. 
And today's topic is real-time sensor anomaly detection and the recovery in connected automated vehicle sensors. So first of all, uh, I would like to talk about um, um, today's agenda. So first of all, I will briefly talk about uh, the background and then objectives of our study, and then go through the methodology and um, talk about some um, experiments. And uh, finally, I will conclude today's presentation. So the background is, um, let's first talk about the background. So our current transportation system um, is under a transition from the traditional transportation system to a uh, more connected automated and intelligent system because of the region, the recent uh, advance of uh, connected and automated vehicle technologies. And we know that there are lots of sensors uh, will be equipped on the CVs uh, so that we can achieve lots of functionalities, including uh, access to the internet or uh, corporate driving. But as vehicles and infrastructures become more and more interconnected, uh, the vulnerability of their sensors to faults or um, and deliberate uh, malicious attack also increase. So. When we talk about sensor measurement, uh, most of the time uh, we have to deal with two uh, concerns. The first one is the sensor anomalies, uh, which can either come from the sensor faults um, or malicious separate attacks. So the sensor faults come, come from, uh, for example, environmental perturbations, short circuits, sensor aging. And for the separate attack, it can come from many different types of attack, for example, falsified data injection, um, um, denial of service, jamming attack, and et cetera. And for measurement noise, uh, that's the second concern, uh, which can come from uh, communication channel noise or uh, sense of background noise. So in this study, uh, we are trying to answer a question, uh, how to smooth the sensor rating and detect those anomalous rating in real time in order to avoid fatal accidents. So, um, in this study, we propose a filtering techniques plus a fault detector, um, which we first construct a state space model using augmented state formulation. And we estimate, estimate unknown variables based on noisy measurement. And then we detect anomalies based on um, innovation or um, residual. And, um, yeah, and um, yeah, so um, before we go to the methodology, um, there are a few assumptions um, that um, I want to briefly cover. So the first assumption is we assume a vehicle under a car falling model. Uh, in this study, we assume a car falling model, but um, in our most recent study, we actually we extend uh, this work to a more general setting uh, that it can be either uh, self uh, freeway, uh, self-driving freeway or a car falling model or a flat tuning model. But for this study, I will uh, mainly focus on uh, car falling model case. And we assume a time delay applied to all the input of the car falling model, which can come from either measurement, onboard measurement time delay, or uh, communication channel time delay. And we assume anomalies come from either sensor faults or from an attack attacker who just injects a random and falsified data into the sensor measurement, trying to cause a wrong estimation of the state variable. And finally, we assume a bounding acceleration of each vehicle within the interval A wing and A max. And the A here is um, just represent the acceleration. So first of all, we construct the state space model from a car falling model in this study. So um, the equation one just show the really standard and um, classical uh, car falling model formulation. Um, so in short, a car falling model is just a function f that takes three inputs, uh, which is uh, velocity of the eagle vehicle, um, the hiding, um, distance hiding headway between uh, the eagle vehicle and its uh, following leading vehicle, and also the relative velocity between um, these two vehicles. And if we define a state vector um, in continuous time, uh, for the eco vehicle as the location and velocity at time t and define the input vector as uh, also the location and velocity of its leading vehicle in this case, then we can rearrange uh, this car model into a uh, state transition model. 
but we observed that um, this um, differential equation or the derivative of the state vector is a function of the state at different uh, time epoch, at multiple time epoch. So in this case, that means this uh, differential equation actually does not satisfy the Markovian property. So which means that we cannot apply, directly apply any Markovian based filtering techniques, for example, common filter family. So um, in this case, what we did is we do a approximation approximation step by defining a augmented state vector. So in short, uh, because of time limit, I'm not going to the details of the formulation, but uh, in short, uh, we define a new state variable as tilde, uh, which has a additional um, dummy variable sigma, uh, which represents the integration of the acceleration of the eco vehicle from time t to uh, time t plus tau. And uh, we assume this, uh, and we use this by defining this uh, augmented dummy state. Um, we can convert the original state transition model into uh, a new augmented state transition model to satisfy the Markovian property. And um, we assume this sigma change really slowly uh, because uh, it will represent the background bias of the cumulative error. So, in this case, uh, by using this uh, new defined uh, augmented state, uh, we can rewrite uh, the previous state transition model into uh, augmented state transition model. And um, here, um, the G represents the motion model or state transition model, and the theta here uh, represents the process noise, uh, which will account for account for all the error introduced by the approximation and modeling accuracy. So uh, we can further uh, obtain the state space model in this case. So um, the state space model consists of uh, one continuous time uh, state transition model and one discrete time measurement model. And um, the first equation, which is the continuous time state transition model represents the intrinsic nature of vehicle's movement. And the second discrete time measurement model represents the digital sensor sampling process as that is the case in, person, in practice. And now I'm going to talk about the filtering and detection. So in this study, we are uh, adopting an adaptive extended common filter um, or um, adaptive EKF which is designed for nonlinear motion model and it can smooth the sensor rating and estimate unknown state variable. And furthermore, uh, we call it adaptive because it can adaptively learn the parameters of the common filter, um, specifically is for the covariance matrix. Those parameters are, are, are key parameters that uh, greatly affect the performance of the common filter. So in this case, instead of uh, giving a prior um, uh, uh, value to that current matrix, uh, we use the adaptive EKF to learn that. And for detector, we are considering two detectors. The first one is the chi-square detector, which is a parametric uh, detection method uh, where it constructs a chi-square test statistics to classify uh, anomalies and a construct a circular or say spherical, spherical uh, boundary over the origin point or zero point. And uh, furthermore, we consider a, a, a semi-supervised learning uh, method called one-class support vector machine or uh, one-class SVM, uh, where it learns the normal data um, behavior and um, it can detect anomalies outside the decision boundary learned from the normal data. So uh, first of all, for adaptive extended common future, not going to the detail, I think, um, uh, Shin, uh, he just uh, talked about consensus common filter. Uh, so they are, um, they're somehow similar related, but not exactly the same thing, but still uh, in general, all common filter type, uh, type uh, algorithm has two major steps. One step is prediction, and the second step is the estimation or um, the update. So essentially for prediction, the common filter will predict uh, the state at the next time epoch from the previous estimation. And then for the update is once it get the measurement at the next time epoch, it just combined, uh, fuse that measurement with its previously um, predicted uh, state 
and to obtain the estimation of the state. And uh, furthermore, for adaptive EKF, uh, it can adaptively uh, approximate the, the covariance matrix of the uh, process noise and the measurement noise. And um, one thing I want to uh, mention is here. So the, in the update step, uh, the adaptive uh, EKF can generate uh, the residual, uh, which is the difference between the measurement and its uh, prediction. And this um, information will be used as a feature for uh, anomaly detection. And for the chi square detector, um, it's a classical or and also well-known um, detector, most of the time conjunct with um, um, common filter, classical common filter, but it can simply uh, can be simply seamlessly uh, applied to EKF as well. So in short, it construct a chi square test statistics and that determine whether the new measurement falls into that gate region uh, or a, a spherical region determined by uh, the parameter psi here. And every time um, we get a new sample measurement, uh, we can calculate the innovation and we can get uh, innovation coherence and we can then calculate the chi-square test statistic. All of those information can be obtained from the common filter. So this chi-square detector actually constructs a semantic boundary over the zero point with radius square root of the psi. But later we'll show that this can cause problem when there exists a time delay. And yes, I'm going to show here. So ideally the innovation should be a zero mean Gaussian variable, uh, but it can become non-zero mean uh, and non-Gaussian even uh, when there is a bias in the background, um, which can come from uh, either time delay or inaccurate model and chi-square detector uh, will not be a good detect detector anymore. So as you can see in this scatter plot, um, the blue circle represent the decision boundary of the chi-square detector. And also at the boundary will be classified as anomalies. And uh, the uh, or orange dots represent uh, the innovation. Um, and uh, you, you can see because of the time delay, they will be, uh, they, they scatter plot, those scatters are, are shifted towards the left. And we will have loss of false positive in this case, if we do not, uh, if we do not move the decision boundary towards um, the left. Uh, so first of all, uh, since we are using augmented formulation and augmented formulation actually can compensate such a bias. So that, that means when we use augmented formulation, it can shift these scatters to towards um, the, the origin points. But still, uh, we'll show later, the shape is not necessarily a, uh, a white Gaussian. Um, so in that case, uh, we further consider a one-class support vector machine model. Actually, we train in multiple of them. So in short, one-class SVM um, is a semi-supervised learning that it can learn the decision boundary from only the normal data. Uh, um, so is essentially trying to solve a quadratic uh, optimization problem. And one thing I want to uh, uh, focus on is uh, one of these parameter called P parameter, uh, and it has a really good property. So it in short, it represents uh, the fraction of the outliers that will be classified as outliers in the training data so that uh, the boundary is trying to separate those outliers and those uh, the rest of the uh, normal data. So that's how it constructs um, a decision boundary in this case. So in this study, uh, we actually train multiple, multiple uh, one class SVM with multiple different uh, parameters P. And um, we first uh, uh, generate uh, the normalized innovation um, at each time epoch. And then we calculate uh, the normalized innovation sequence over uh, a length of n shifting time window. And uh, we switch between different one class SVM based on the value of that average um, of the normalized innovation sequence. So um, 
I'm going to talk about the case study. So in this, in, in the experiments, we are using um, a safety pilot data set uh, collected uh, from University of Michigan um, uh, Transportation Research Institute, or say Amtray. And for car volume model, since we have to specify a car volume model because this is observer-based mass detection method. So um, in the study, we're using car volume model, uh, a well, really well-known car volume model called the Intelligent Driver Model or IDM model. And um, for anomalies type, uh, anomaly types, we consider four types of anomaly or which are uh, widely used in the literature for sensor anomalies uh, detection, sensor anomaly detection, uh, which are specifically instant noise, bias, and drift. And all of those uh, anomalies are um, generated uh, randomly with random duration and magnitude and inject to the testing data set with 10% of the anomaly rate. And um, we calculate the AUC score, uh, which is, stands for uh, error under the curve, uh, which is a score represent the performance of the detector. And we calculate AUC score of three scenario in three experiments and there's three time delay settings. So that basically means we have three table, each of them has uh, a nine combination. And um, the three scenarios are, uh, first, we are not using leading vehicles information, uh, just use a chi-square detector. And the second scenario is we're using leading vehicles information and use chi-square detector. And the third scenario is we're using leading information, leading vehicles information as well as one class as we have. And the three settings are um, different attack uh, parameters. So from setting one to setting three, the um, attack parameters become more, the, the anomalies become more and more subtle and it's more difficult to detect. Um, and we tested on three time delay, tau equal to zero, tau equal to 0 0.5 and tau equal to 1.5 seconds. And as you can see, one class SVM obtained the best performance over all testing scenario. And uh, we can also see that um, as we increase the time delay, the overall performance um, uh, decrease. So we can see a negative impact of the time delay on uh, general anomaly detection. Um, I think I'm uh, kind of out of time, so I'm not going into the details uh, about this. So it's, this essentially shows we use the augmented uh, state formulation. We can also obtain lots of uh, performance boost, but when there's no time delay, actually we will lose some performance because augmented state formulation essentially introduce more, more noises or more uncertainties to the, to the uh, state transition model. Um, yeah, so this figure shows when we use a augmented state formulation, it can uh, greatly compensate uh, uh, the variance of the shape uh, of the scatter plot, the uh, irregular shape. And okay, so to conclude, so in this study, we propose the signal filtering and the learning based anomaly detection techniques to improve the safety of the CVs. We use augmented state formulation to compensate potential bias. And we use um, adaptive EKF, or uh, which is a, fam a general, is a special um, child of uh, EKF family to smooth the sensor ratings of the CV based on nonlinear car volume mo motion model uh, with time delay where the leading vehicle's trajectory is used by the subject vehicle to de de detect the sensor anomalies. And the results show that EKF with the one class SVM uh, and using the uh, leading vehicle's information performs the best among different testing scenario. And this concludes today's uh, presentation. And yeah, thank you. And I'm open to any questions. Yeah, thank you for your uh, great presentation. So any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, uh, this is Shane. Uh, I, I saw, uh, thanks for your presentation, and I saw in your presentation you have two approaches to detect the uh, non anomaly signal. Uh, you have the chi-square method, and you also have the support uh, vector machine. Uh, yes. I'm wondering uh, how do you fuse the uh, results from those two different uh, methods? Because... Uh, oh. I think uh, the chi-square uh, detection method, uh, de detection or the uh, OC SVM will 
uh, give you some different results under the different signal. We're not fusing the two detector results. So instead, those two methods are just two direction, uh, such that we will comp the chi square detector most of the time will be used as a benchmark in this study. And um, essentially, actually, we propose um, a for OCSVM, we propose a switching policy uh, for different among different OCSVM models, which will be the main contributions. And chi square detector. Well, there are nothing new with chi-square detector, so we just use it as a benchmark conjunct with augmented state formulation. Okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think we can move to the next. Uh, speaker, uh, Chen Shi Chen. Uh, he's uh, with the uh, Penn State University. He's going to talk about a um, prefix time-based privacy budget allocation optimization algorithm for the uh, transit smart card data. There's a little bit different types of data, but we'd like to see uh, any uh, privacy type of budget allocation models. Okay. Um, Chen Shi, the floor is yours. Uh, Chen Shi, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Maybe you're mute. I can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, can you see my please, screen? Yes, please go ahead. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My oh open my video cam. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chen Xi Chen. The topic of my presentation today is optimization of transit smart card data publishing based on differential privacy. My presentation will contain four sections, introduction, preliminaries, methodology, numerical experiments, and the results analysis. Uh, with the rapid advancement of information and communication technologies, a variety of data collection methods have been developed to collect the information uh, on individual travelers' space trajectory. These data carry rich information on traffic conditions and the travelers' activity patterns. They have been widely shared and used by researchers for variety of purposes, uh, such as city planning and intelligent transportation. Uh, thus, privacy issues have been a major concern in transportation engineering. The table shows some smart card data of the pasture trajectories of Shenzhen nature. As a common practice, this data will be publicly available after some simple attempts at autonomy uh, to protect the passenger's privacy. The names and card IDs have been anonymized by pseudo identifier. However, the data set is still under the threat of privacy leak leakage. Think of a simple scenario. On June 7th, Alice took a subway from home to office as usual. She was lucky and just in time for the subway. So she took a picture casually and shared in the social media. However, a bad guy noticed the picture contains the station name Wu Xing at, uh, at the time. And he knows Alice walked around the Longchen Square. Uh, he found out the arrival time to Longchen Square in the subway schedule and, it, uh, and found it around 8.14. Now, the bad guy has a background knowledge. Then he queried the trajectory in the public data from Shenzhen Metro. The table is a part of Shenzhen Metro smart car transition data. Uh, the query result shows there is only one record in the data set. He can get Alice's pseudo identifier and her old trajectories. In fact, the time is no need to be very accurate to find Alice's pseudo ID. From all experience, uh, if we know the approximate time with a range of half an hour, we can still find her pseudo identifier and entire trajectory. And the source information uh, is not very hard to get. Once the hacker finds the entire trajectory, a lot of sensitive information will be revealed. The home address, work address can be directly retrieved via from the trajectory of the daily routine. Her habits, customs and health information can also be detected by the points of interest she often goes through. For example, Alice went home 
around 10 p.m. from Thai, Thai end station with near a shopping mall. Therefore, uh, her habits can be de detected. The, the health information can also be detected similarly. Uh, this example proves that making charteries packed plate may be harmful to privacy protection, even when we have hidden the real name and card ID. There's no perfect solution that can publish all information while the privacy is safe. Researchers always want to mine more information from the data, as the more accurate information published means larger probability of privacy leakage. So there's always a trade-off between privacy protection level and utility. We need to evaluate the privacy and the utility so that we can evaluate our algorithm. Uh, we will discuss it uh, later. The chartery data is very common in translation. Uh, the, uh, these data are collected by different equipment and organizations, but in essence, they describe the vehicle movements in the spatial and temporal dimensions. As such, conceptually, we can extract two important dimensions from this very detailed data, with the number representing the, uh, the time and uh, later representing the space dimension. For example, a trajectory from site building at 3, uh, 13 p.m. to hum the building from 3.35 p.m. can be simply, but, uh, simply represented by 1x to 2y. The table shows a trajectory data set containing eight trajectory from trajectory one to trajectory eight. For this sample trajectory data, uh, a prefix tree can be generated. In the prefix tree, each time location point from the smart card data set becomes an arc, and the two arcs form a trajectory pair. Number in the cycle mean the counts of the trajectories on the path from root to node. Root to node. The, uh, the top node is called root node, and the bottom nodes are called leaf nodes. For example, the number eight in the root node means there are a total of eight trajectories. The number two here means uh, there are two trajectories contained two x, which means at location x at time two we can find in the table is trajectory two and trajectory three. And uh, uh, one here means only one trajectory uh, contains uh, the whole trajectory from two X to three C to four Y. And differential privacy algorithm is the most important concept in the research. Uh, it widely used by uh, many agencies like census data. Another example is the technology companies like uh, Apple and Google. They collected all personal information from the smartphones. Differential privacy can help reduce the risk of privacy leakage before sharing this information to some advertisement company. Of course, uh, some companies don't care about the privacy. So in general, uh, differential privacy guarantees that the risk of privacy leakage will be controlled by a parameter epsilon, which refers to the privacy budget. Think of two data sets, D1 and D2 are two data sets including name and uh, age. There's only one record R, Mary age 12 are different between two tables. So we call the two data sets are neighboring data sets. Now we have a mechanism M. The mechanism will transfer original data set D to the sanitized data set D hat. D hat follows the distribution shown in the figure. X axis is the value of the new data set. D hat Y axis is, uh, is probability of each uh, possible value. So the figure shows the distribution of the transferred data set. As a solid curve represents the distribution of sanitized uh, uh, the distribution of sanitized the data set D hat. They had one from D1, and uh, uh, the dash curve represents the distribution of sanitized the data set D hat two from D2. If the ratio difference between uh, two distributions is always less than or equal to e to power epsilon, then the mechanism M gives epsilon differential privacy.
the idea behind differential privacy is that if the effect of making an arbitrary single substitution in the data set is small enough, the query result cannot be used to infer much about any single individual and therefore provide individual privacy. That saying, according to a sanitized data set, it's hard to tell whether the original data set is D1 or D2. The primate epsilon refers a privacy budget, uh, which controls the level of privacy guarantee. A smaller epsilon represents smaller dif difference between two data sets, and hacker will be hard to find if Mary is in the original data sets or not. Therefore, provides a stronger uh, privacy label. So we want to obtain a smaller privacy budget while we know, but, uh, but we know it's always hard to control our budget. Uh, because of the trade-off between privacy protection and data utility, to evaluate the privacy preserving algorithm, we can compare the utility of two algorithms that have the same level of privacy guarantee. Utility means how different the published synthetic dataset D hat is from real trajectory dataset D. Most similar these two datasets are higher utility, the so synthetic dataset is. For example, researchers want to know how many people take subway from station A to station B uh, every morning. For the privacy purpose, we want to get us accurate data, but a total round number is useless for research. So we use the relative error to evaluate the utility of our anonymity algorithm. Relative error means I got a random trajectory, then I asked the synthetic data set and the real data set, how many trajectories can you find that are same with mine? The synthetic data set told me the QD hat and the real data set told me QD. Relative error can be calculated by this equation. Then to achieve differential privacy, we need to add Laplace noise to the nodes. That saying the numbers in the nodes will be, add, uh, be added a random variable that follows Laplace distribution. If we assign a privacy budget of epsilon i to a prefix chain node i, the potential error brought by adding Laplace noise can be calculated by, by this equation. Then after calculating the expectation of introduced the air, we are able to construct the relationship between privacy budget and relative air. The, uh, the total algorithm contains four procedures, building tree, allocating a budget, adding noise and output. The first procedure is building tree. That's a procedure of transferring the original trajectories to prefix tree. Budget allocation is a core procedure. It optimizes the, the budget allocation to make the relative error as small as possible, while the total budget keeps the same. Then we add noise based on the allocated budget to the nodes. And finally, output the sanitized trajectory. According to the property of uh, Laplace noise and differential privacy, we can simplify the objective function Subjective function is minimized relative error with given privacy budget epsilon. That means the uh, utility with a given privacy preserving level is maximized. Uh, the constraint function means to take advantage of the total budget. Summation of budgets along each path from root to node should be the same. Then converts above a problem with Lagrangian reclassification method and calculates the first directive. The number of equations and the variables are the same, then the problem can be solved. As the last part is a numerical experiments and a comparison of all algorithms to other algorithms. In this research, we focus on data collected by a smart card that recorded the payment history of travelers in major stations uh, in Shenzhen, China. Uh, these four data sets has different data size, a time range, max trajectory lines, and uh, average trajectory lines. 
is the result was compared with three other similar differential privacy based algorithms. These four figures show the relative error of all algorithms. The red line represents all algorithms. Uh, we, we can find it has a, a lowest average relative error in each data set. Therefore, we can conclude that all algorithm has the best utility under the same privacy leakage number. And these four figures show runtime of all algorithms. The runtime of all algorithms increases linearly, which is a sign of a good prob uh, probability and indicates algorithms quality uh, quality where deal, uh, when dealing with larger data sets. Uh, and that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chen Shi, for your presentation. So any um, uh, questions from audience? Um, I, I maybe ask a very uh, big, high level, big picture question. So I, think, I mean, the, the, the privacy, um, in the methodology presented here applied to a, a smart car, smart bus car data, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of the research we're doing now, you know, connect, connected vehicles, uh, share mobility uh, data, right? These are all the things that people are talking about privacy. So do you think your methodology can be applied to those uh, use cases and uh, what kind of adaptations do you need uh, to for those applications? Or do you do you kind of thinking about extensions to those areas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are actually- I, mean, I, I personally feel those are areas that have more bigger uh, privacy concerns as compared to a bus uh, public transit, maybe not, but please go ahead. Yeah, we are trying to, to, to do that. Uh, the difference is the, is the form of the data set. For example, we, now we, we just uh, research, focus on the trajectory transit data. And for the CAV, maybe we need to consider the GPS data or, or other form data. Uh, the, the most challenging part is to find a model that can, uh, for example, in our algorithm, uh, we, we've uh, introduced uh, the prefix tree that can form the uh, trajectory data into a tree and then the uh, differential privacy can be can be can in sense the noise can be added to the to each node and uh, for to the CAV data or the trajectory data uh, we need uh, we also need to find a model to that can use the differential privacy uh, algorithm. Yeah, yeah, um, sounds great. Thank you for your answer. Okay, um, if you have questions, I think the privacy is definitely a, a hot topic these days. Um, if you have questions, can reach out to uh, Chen Chi and, and their team. Okay, our last uh, speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Jing Liu. He's gonna uh, talk about his research with a student on the uh, clustering algorithm uh, to characterize road, roadway environments based on uh, street view imagery. Uh, so Professor Liu, do you wanna go ahead, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Professor Ma. Um, well, this is um, just the um, last minute for me to jump in to uh, present the research on behalf of my student uh, who just graduated and is on his uh, graduation travel and he is unable to connect to the internet to make the presentation. So, all right. Uh, well, I mean, apparently I'm not familiar with my inter uh, computer. All right, let's just go ahead. Uh, so um, this, um, this research is trying to really understand the really environment. It's a quite traditional topic, and uh, we hope this can be helpful for the helping uh, evaluating the safety performance of those roads. In addition to those roadway inventory attributes that we already know, like number of lanes, main ways, and shoulder presence, or other attributes that we can get from road inventory data. And we also think maybe this is some interesting information, valuable information for helping the vehicle making driving decisions, not uh, the human, well, maybe human drivers, maybe autonomous vehicles. So what are we are doing? Overall framework, we get the, uh, group, uh, the Google Street View data images, just a bunch of images of streets, and then 
uh, going through this convolutional auto in encoder, trying to understand those some of the key attributes in those images. And uh, the, I mean, which is magical, also unfortunate that it's just we don't know what attributes are really being playing a big role in the images there. We just need a new network, new network to do the work. And end of this uh, outcome of that is uh, okay. Now we kind of we can we, we may be able to we may be able to classify the real environments and then we try to understand those environments. So data collection, we got a data uh, for the area of, of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, and we have uh, sampled the road uh, the street images every twenty five meters, and uh, we in total we sampled over five thousand images. And most of the images, uh, yeah, just based on Google's map data, is collected. I mean, October, November, twenty twenty. So it's fairly recent. And this is just a little bit more information about the convolutionary, um, convolutional auto encoder. Uh, the first step is encoder trying to uh, compress images into low dimension representations. You may think of the uh, pixels; they're just uh, it's really high dimension. And um, Going through some uh, convolutional neural network, we can come. I mean, compress, reduce the dimensions, and by, by keeping those key attributes, and so that is embedded features in the images. And then uh, the next step is decoder. We, I mean, are we able to reconstruct images with those algor algor uh, uh, those uh, what say whatever they 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 algorithms or uh, rules we uh, memorized in the algorithms, and then with those. Uh, embedded attributes or features or latent features, we classify those world environments. And this are the cluster results. And we cluster the world environments into six clusters. And we just visually give them some, some names, uh, try and describe those cluster, clusters, somehow they make sense. Uh, cluster number one, which is a, a road and open space. And you don't, I mean, it's quite, I mean, uh, good. And we, we don't have much, uh, we don't have limitation on both sides of roads. And cluster number two is like, okay, we got something on the left side of the road and cluster three is something on the right side. And class four, class five, it's both sides, but slightly are uh, uh, slightly affected. I mean, uh, affecting the, 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 visual, uh, uh, the, the visual of the driving of the drivers. And this uh, cluster six is like, now we have, we got a lot of uh, um, either trees, plantations, or buildings on both sides of the roads, and then we are definitely limiting our side distance, and probably will make you feel like you are being pressured uh, by something on the, um, on the side of the road. So then I would likely to, I mean, potentially would affect your driving, uh, driving decisions. And we try to connect and try to tie those clusters to those driving performances, and because we got the data from that area, the driving data, uh, which is a lot of connected vehicle pilot project that is done 10 years ago. Uh, we have those uh, driving data. We try to tie those driving data to the clusters of road environments. And we found, we, we found that, yes, they're quite correlated. So that means our cluster to road environments make sense in terms of driving, in terms of driving. And our next step is trying to connect those, uh, tie those uh, clusters to the crushes, safety performances to say whether those are additional attributes we can use to explain the safety patterns in the network. And applications, we hope, we think those might, might be some I mean, useful information for agencies to uh, manage their uh, roads, facilities, and do their road inventories. Because right now, they only have a limited number of variables in their database. And we think now maybe we are able to have more variables, but somehow we have to make those variables meaningful. And with those information, we may be able to do safety evaluation with safety evaluation with more information in addition to some of the I mean data we are, we can get from the current road inventory data, and we hope those information may be able to uh, useful for quantifying the operation design domains for supporting the autom automated driving systems. Um, because right now our understanding is that the ODD is quite uh, qualitative. We think uh, is there a way we can make it more quantitative? Maybe this might provide some information to uh, quantitatively describing the ODDs. So that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the brief presentation. I do appreciate it and uh, keep us on, uh, on, on time. Um, any questions from, from the audience? I think it's a very interesting presentation. Any questions? Well, I'm unable to provide many technical details, but that's pretty much just the scope of the research. 
I think the use case is very interesting. You know, you said that, you know, the, like your last slides, you have to talk about safety evaluation, right? You know, in safety. Yeah, evaluation. that's right. I mean, I mean, for I mean, and our team, I mean, we are not really thinking that much about how the automakers are going to make autonomous vehicles. We are more thinking about, okay, can we use those some kind of deep learning neural network to help the agencies to understand their environments? And probably, I mean, if we can tie those ODDs with those environments, okay, probably agencies will know, I mean, the readiness of their infrastructures about those autonomous driving systems. Uh, I mean, quantitatively, I mean, we, we try to um, just per help them to evaluate their infrastructures or say which roads or segments or corridors that are being are more ready for ADS or less ready for ADS. I mean, they, they may be prioritize some corridors for ADS. I mean, I, I don't know right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And even some firms are trying to do this, you know, people, I see people start doing these things using cameras uh, to, to detect the environment, even LiDAR sensors, you know, to do an inventory. Uh, and then and this data can give you more detailed data on your asset, right, instead of just... That, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right now, you just... Uh, I mean, those latent attributes, features, you, you don't know what's there. I mean, you, it's it's just a point in the images and I mean, it, it's not meaningful right now. We, we, we try to make it meaningful. Sounds great. Yeah, very nice presentation. Any other questions? Last call. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jun, for your uh, presentation. And all the, the speakers for presentation, just, uh, Everyone knows that all the, the presentation the slides will be posted on the our uh, BTR website in you know in a couple of days or weeks. So if you want to revisit some of the presentations, feel free to go there. And it's going to be a, available resources. I think we will also send out emails telling you that when these resources are available. Okay, um, I do appreciate uh, everyone participating, particularly those who has been uh, sitting here for two hours, almost two hours. Thank you very much again for uh, uh, you joining our session. Uh, now it's time to switch to other sessions of the conference. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.